Hello everyone, I'm Nick Hopwood and this is a video explaining my adaptation of Martin Hammersley's framework for appraising, critically appraising ethnographic research. Martin Hammersley initially developed it with a specific focus on ethnography. I think it's very applicable actually to qualitative research much more generally. Um, I'll move now from the screen over to uh, Prezi and you'll be able to see some uh, illustration of what I mean so I can organise my ideas. The Prezi you can uh, download if you wish but there'll be no audio commentary on it. Um, some of you might be working with me in a qualitative data analysis workshop in which case this will be part of the flip learning activities I've asked you to do in preparation for the workshop and I've made the reading available to you upon which the original framework was based. If not you might just be interested in qualitative research and how you think about doing it well in which case I hope you find this useful and I should take my hat off to Martin Hammersley, whose framework I've been using to think about research for many years now, and I find it really, really useful and uh, inspiring to work with. Okay, so I'm just going to bring up my Prezi. So you can see, I've called it an adaptation of Hammersley's framework for critical appraisal of qualitative research. It's mainly got four big concepts in it around the square and some uh, linked uh, ideas and assumptions. Here you can see I want to be very clear about the original source for this. Now Martin Hammersley has been updating his publications since, uh, but the first time I encountered this was in the 1998 version. So a lot of the core ideas are absolutely Martin Hammersley's, but I'm adapting some elements of it, I think because it's not just about reading ethnographic research critically, but qualitative research more generally. Before we go on, I think it's very important to be clear about some assumptions, and I'm borrowing here from Martin Hammersley in the first phrase. He says there's no doctrine of immaculate perception. What I mean is that in this framework of critically analysing qualitative research, or um, having a critical reading of qualitative research, we don't assume with whatever method we have, observation, interviews, surveys, focus groups, that we have direct access to reality. There is always selection involved in the data, sometimes deliberate, sometimes subconscious. There is always interpretation. So there's no immaculate perception, meaning no direct way of engaging with the world out there. There is always a filtering process and a human element. And how good research appears to us can't be separated from the modes of writing, rhetoric, rhetoric and argument that the authors use. That might make you a little bit uncomfortable, but its uh, I don't think there's any other way of thinking about it. The good research written up poorly and unpersuasively is hard to see as good research, whereas persuasive arguments and clear writing can make uh, robust research seem even stronger. So the overall picture. Now, I've changed some of Martin Hammersley's words from his original model. I have to talk about the big picture, which Hammersley would call the focus, your study, which Hammersley would call the case, claims and conclusions, and in between your study and claims we have to think about methods and evidence. I'll quickly go through each of these. So the big picture, or what Martin Hammersley would call the focus, this is the more general set of phenomena or interest. It's a topic of broad area of concern. Now often this might be something that you assume people care about automatically, but still, we remember, and I'll say this in many of my videos and blogs, nobody cares about your research until you make them care. So often our research is a, a small study about a bigger thing, and we start by thinking about what's this bigger thing? How clearly is it articulated? And what kinds of questions are being asked about this? Now Martin Hammersley called this the focus. I think somehow focus might be not the best choice of word because... I think what comes next is more focused than this. This is the big picture and then after this we focus on what Martin Hammersley would call the case. But I think we think about the big picture and your study. Now you'll see relationships between this and the framework I often refer to uh, developed by Barbara Kamler and Pat Thompson for writing abstracts which is about locate, focus, report and argue. In which case the big picture would be the locate and here we have what Barbara and Pat would call your focus. Now, this does not mean, if we call it a case, that all research is a case study. But most of the time, we can't study everything that's part of that bigger picture. Often we have to study something smaller. And the case refers to, or the focus refers to, what we're studying empirically. I.e., with particular data or evidence. Now, 
what happens is um, we have to, because we can't study everything, we have to make selections. And that could be sample if you mean participants. We select things in terms of time, when in history we're looking at something, whether it's contemporary, how far back we go, space, whether it's set in a particular country, city, school, organisation, setting, and also what Barbara and Pat uh, might call in their abstracts or tiny text approach, an angle, the way we look at a phenomenon. So something like climate change could be a big picture. And then a particular study or focus within that, if you were to use Martin Hammersley's phrasing, could be something about the impact of sea level rise on low-lying uh, countries. And then an angle could be a particularly gendered angle or a feminist angle, in which case you'd be looking at particularly the interest implications for women or children or something like that. So in this idea, if you're referring to my other video where I've talked about a four plus part design framework, this is about the strategy and the sampling, the first two parts of that. Now, what Martin Hammersley makes us think about is the nature of this vertical arrow you can see on the screen. What is the relationship between what he calls the focus and your case, or what I call a big picture and your study? What are the reasons for these selections? What are their implications? How is this case different from the focus, or how is your study different from the bigger picture? In what way is this relationship well justified and explicit, I should say? Does the nature of the relationship between what the big picture is and your study is influence or limit the conclusions that you can draw? For example, if you're looking at something that has a very long historical trajectory and you're only looking at a particular period in time, might that limit the shelf life of research? So uh, many studies in education, for example, might look at technology in classrooms. Now, if your study is tied to a particular form of technology, is the, the technology in classrooms could be the big picture. If your study is about just iPads, what happens when people stop using iPads? Does your, show, does your research no longer have any validity? This is not the same as meaning that research to have shelf life or wider relevance means it's empirically generalizable or has what you might call external validity. I wouldn't want to suggest that at all, but there are lots of ways in which small-scale qualitative study, very specifically focused, can have a wider relevance. So then we have the big picture and your study, and now we're going to look at the methods. And this is what I would call methods and techniques, the third and fourth parts of my four and a bit part design framework. This is about what you do to generate evidence. And you have to think about the relationship between the researcher and the people studied, because this affects the quality of all your evidence. Not all reactivity, i.e. influence that you may ha have on a social situation, is bad. If you develop strong relationships of trust with people, and they're very candid with your interview, your relationship with them has had a good influence on your data. But we have to think about that. And this goes back to the, uh, the assumptions right at the beginning about there being no doctrine of immaculate perception. There is always that relationship and inference and uh, interpretation going on. What Martin Hammersley does, and I think this is a really, really neat part of his framework, is to talk distinguish between claims and conclusions. I'll talk first about claims. These are the things that you would like other people to believe about the case you've studied, or if it's not a case study, the thing that you've studied rather than the big picture. Martin Hammersley talks about lots of different kinds of claims, definitional claims, descriptive claims. Definitional claims could be this is an instance of a certain kind of thing, of an X. Descriptive claims, evaluative claims, passing judgment, causal claims that this seem to lead to Y. That doesn't mean that you're doing a trial or an experiment. And there are value-based claims as well, um, which may be different from evaluative ones because the, the if evaluative ones may make comparisons between two points of evidence and a value-based claim may can make a comparison between a particular kind of evidence and a sort of values framework or judgment framework. So claims relate to what you've studied. Interestingly, a lot of claims in social science actually can be boiled down to the idea of X equals Y. You use one vocabulary, particularly from a theory or a way of seeing the world, to describe something else. So myself, I might say that a particular interaction between a, an adult and a, a, a child or a, a professional and a parent seeking help with parenting might be an instance of scaffolding. I would say that there is an example of scaffolding. So that would be an X equals Y kind of claim based on a theory. So we have to think about the relationship between your study and claims, this horizontal arrow you can see in the middle of your screen now. And what's that relationship about? It's all about evidence. 
We judge claims about a study, or what Martin Hamilton would call a case, based on the evidence presented to support them. Now we have to remember, and I've mentioned this when I've talked about in, uh, interview analysis and things like that, we don't take evidence for granted, but we critically appraise it in relation to the methods. Evidence does not speak for itself. We must allow for and critique interpretations of it. So when we're critically evaluating a study or critically reading a study, we want to think, what's the big picture? Is it well justified? Is the particular study that's done or the focus here um, relate to that big picture in a sensible way? Do I understand what limitations are born of that relationship? That was the first vertical line. And then what claims were made? Are the claims interesting and valuable? And what's the evidence to support that? And we have to first say, what's the quality of the evidence? And is the evidence of the right kind to support those claims? The evidence needed for a definitional claim would be different from the evidence needed from an evaluative claim. So we also have to think about the researchers' critique and interpretations. Do we know enough about their process of analysis to know how they got from their case or their what they studied through their methods to their claims? Of course, analysis is one of those big steps in that process. Now we think about conclusions. Now it's no accident if I just skip back that claims and your study are on the same horizontal line and conclusions and the big picture are. Claims are about your study, conclusions are about the big picture. Okay, so we've got a vertical line here now between claims and conclusions. So it's the opposite of the vertical line going in the opposite direction between the big picture and what you've studied. So when we think about conclusions, we think, has the study said something of value or interest in relation to that original bigger picture, what Martin Hamsley would call the focus? To what extent, sorry for the spelling mistake there, does the relationship between claims and evidence concerning the case support firm conclusions about the focus? Or to what extent does the relationship between claims and evidence concerning what you've actually studied support firm conclusions about the bigger picture? I think this is a really neat thing that Martin Hammersley's done, again, distinguishing between claims which are about what you've studied and conclusions which are about the bigger picture. Claims have a very strong burden of evidence. You shouldn't make claims for which there is not robust evidence. But conclusions, you don't necessarily have direct evidence about these things you're saying about the bigger picture. It's about what you do is you think about the relationship between your claims and your conclusions and it's the way that you took your big picture into your case study or what Martin Hammers would call your focus into your case that determines then what you can do in the other direction now in extending your claims to conclusions. I'm not talking here about making false generalizations but it is about how you make your study of wider relevance and speak back to that big thing which was what you hooked people in with and what was important and interesting. Now we have to think, how do conclusions relate to claims? Conclusions should have a clear basis in the claims. They can't spring up from nowhere. It's not about having a twist like there might be in a good movie. But conclusions must go beyond the claims. Sometimes people get criticised in research for over-concluding, thinking they've changed the world and getting a Nobel Prize when they haven't. An equally poor thing to do, in my view, is to under-conclude under and just to stick with your claims and not do that hard work of thinking about, well, what does this mean for the wider picture? It doesn't necessarily mean you have a solid answer for everything, but there will surely be speculations, implications, ways of thinking about something in a different way, uh, something that might contest dominant ways of thinking, theoretical inference, suggestions, it may seem that. You have to do that hard work and you have to use your language carefully to make sure that you don't articulate conclusions as if they were claims. So this is why I said about good research not being divorced or detached from the way you write about research. The quality of your argument and your rhetoric but also your precision with wording helps you distinguish between claims which are about what you've studied and conclusions which are about what you're interested in and the bigger picture. So here we go. Got to keep clear about our assumptions and then we go from the big picture or focus to your study or the case. We think about the methods that we use to generate relevant evidence to make claims. When we assess people's claims, we do not take their evidence for granted, and we have to think about the methods that underpin them to generate that evidence in the first place, and their process of analysis that led them to particular claims. Claims refer to the case that was studied. Conclusions refer to that bigger picture or focus. And we have to think about the relationship between claims and conclusions. And in order to do that, we have to understand the relationship between the big picture and the case. 
So the horizontal line between your, your study and the claims is really important, and evidence is at the centre of this there, and the vertical lines between the bigger picture and your study, or the claims and the conclusions, are really important in managing how your study has something to say of broader significance. Martin Hammersley originally developed this with reference to ethnography. I think this framework can be applied to any kind of research. It does allow for different uh, assumptions about what evidence counts as and different methods. I don't think it's narrow in its vision. It doesn't just apply to sort of canons of ethnography. The kind of claims that will be made and what evidence will be needed to support those claims will be very different if you're working in interpretivist paradigms or critical paradigms or postmodern or other things. So I think this is a very flexible framework and I think it's an excellent example of what I often refer to which is the idea of parsimony. The balance between power in explanation or uh, kind of concepts and complexity. The four main ideas here, big picture, your study, claims and conclusions, nice and simple. We can add a layer of complexity by thinking about methods and evidence and the different relationships between these. But in its simplicity, a very powerful tool. So, I hope you found that useful. It's a fairly quick whiz through. Um, I strongly recommend following up with Martin Hammersley's uh, chapter on this, and particularly the most up-to-date ones. I should say I've received some communications from Martin about this, which I was delighted to. And Martin was quite supportive of the way I was interpreting and adapting his framework. But I do want to make it clear that uh, where my interpretations differ from or have gone beyond what he's initially written. I hope you find this useful. Um, just to say again, it's big picture, your study coming across what you claim, that relationship is underpinned by the evidence that you have and that evidence comes from the methods you use, you then use that evidence to interpret things to make claims. Those claims are about what you've studied. So those claims you then make conclusions of wider relevance to the thing that people care about more generally. Martin Hammersley calls it focus, case, claims, conclusions. I just change the language slightly and call it big picture, your study, claims and conclusions. I hope you found this useful. Take care. Bye-bye.